welcome to uh, to our um, Antal Special Interest Group. And uh, today we're going to look at source, different types of source, and um, just do an overview of, of, of source, take a look at the principles of sharpening. I don't intend to actually sharpen the saw, but I'll show you a few of the tools you need, and, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And please, as always, don't hesitate to uh, to ask questions as we go along. And, uh, you know, if uh, I find myself running long, I will just have to cut some of it out. But um, the first thing I want to talk about is basically whether it's a, a hand saw or a machine saw, the way a saw cuts is almost always the same way. And there, in the world of saws, there are basically two kinds of saws, your cross-cut saws and your rip saws. And the rip saws are designed for cutting a long, long grain. So, you know, that's what we, we would normally have on, the, uh, on, a, on a table saw, for example. Um, Cross-cut uh, blades cut in a slightly different way, and we'll go into the principles of those shortly. Um, but they, uh, <laughs> mine's gone blank. Um, so those are your basic two kinds of, of saws. I'm going to go straight into how they work, and then I'll show you a few of the saws that, uh, that, I, that I have and a couple that belong to the shop. And we'll do a little, uh, I'll do a little demonstration of how I cut dovetails, um, which is something I'm learning. By the way, saws are not my, I don't really have a field of expertise, but saws are something that I've, I've used a fair amount over the years, but I haven't, I've only very recently got into sharpening them. I've sharpened my first one about a year ago, and I'm still trying to refine it. The basic sharpening of a saw blade is really not even as difficult. As, it doesn't even need as much precision as a sharpening plane blade or a chisel blade. It's pretty simple stuff. It's you just you need a few basic pieces of equipment, and you can make um, make uh, your saw. I'm, I've just mentioned make your saw. Um, from what I understand, if you do it in a refined way, you can really make your saw safe. But I'll, I'll demonstrate how you can take an old beater or how I have taken an old beater and made it into something worthwhile. But anyway, we'll go over to the basic principles of, of the saws. So your two kinds of saws are cross cut and rip cut. And as I say, the rip cut is for long grain and the cross cut is for, um, is for cutting across the grain where you need a nice clean cut on those on those ends. And actually, in many ways, your rip cup is also cutting just the ends of the straw. So what I've got here, this is the grain of the wood, and these are just a representation of the straws, of, of your, if you like, of the fibers in the wood. And um, basically, the way it works is that, well, first of all, I'll talk briefly about the set. When you set up a saw, because it's cutting down through the wood, and the wood moves a little bit, and we are human beings, we are not able to keep that saw absolutely 100% straight. If you just cut straight down with blades, you would cut through the wood, but at some point the wood's going to close in on you and bind. So what we do is when we, when we set a saw up, we set it up so that if this represents a cross section through the, the, the blade of the saw like this, um, the, uh, what we do is, is we, we set it up so that alternating teeth are set to one side or the other of the blade. And the amount of set that we put on it depends on the size of the teeth, what we want to do with the saw, and you know how we want to use it. Um, if you're doing something like uh, dovetails, you want a very, very, very fine set, but you don't, you're not going in all that far usually, and, you, and so you don't have a problem with binding. But if you're trying to cut through, you know, a, a piece of eight quarter that's 10 inches wide, you probably want something that's set up with a slightly wider set so that when, by the time you get down into the depth of your saw, you're not, you're, you're at least reducing um, and I'll, I'll go into some of the features of the older source and the, the, the developments that have happened down through the, uh, through, through the human race. 
So anyway, so we've got our saw set up, and the next point to set up is the teeth. In the case of a rip cut saw, I'm going to use an analogy to a chisel. You set up the top of your rip cut teeth to be like a chisel, like this. So it's slightly offset with a skew, but, but basically your chisel cuts through the wood, and, and those chisel tips will just take you all the way down the ground. If you're doing a cross cut, you're, you set it up so it's more of a knife than a chisel tip. So this is a, um, this is a marking knife for the setting uh, workout. And basically, you're looking at putting a knife there. So at this point, it's cutting here, right? The rip saw is cutting up here, up here. And this baby is cutting the sides. So it's really got a different function. The difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw is simply how you file the teeth. That's all. If you took just a, a regular set of teeth like this on a brand new piece of steel and you had the teeth cut out, you could then make it a crosscut or a rip saw, depending on your choice. Um, and there's lots of complications that have to do with an amount of teeth and so on. Um, dovetail saws tend to have a, a very fine teeth. Some teeth are cutting, uh, you know, a rip saw tends to, that's cut, you know, for, for cutting planks and so on, tends to have a little less. Uh, um, mine's gone blank. Okay, time for it. Any questions so far? Dead silence. Okay. I've either not made any sense or I've played my... Hey, Paul, what about saws that are labeled as combinations, then how are they grind, ground? I don't know how they grind. You can use a cross-cut saw as a rip saw, but it'll take you about twice the time. And the whole essence of a hand saw is having it sharp enough that the saw does the work. Um, so it'll take you twice the time and probably twice as many strokes with the rip saw. I don't know about the combination. I just... I'm still in my early days of learning about SARS. So, yeah, so this, but this is uh, what we're doing. This is, this is the representation of the curve that the, the, the blade cuts. And as you can see, it's, it is a little wider than the, uh, than the, um, uh, than, than the, the width of the blade itself. So, uh, without further ado, let's move on to, um, Actually, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just, shall I just no, we can bring to this. come to about here? Okay, so um, there are all kinds of different saws for, okay, for um, different purposes, hand saws. I'm going to show you a few of them. Most of them are from ones I've picked up over the years. Initially, I didn't understand much about saws, and uh, I just kind of bought them. Um, and, what I've discovered is that as a beginner, Japanese scores are really nice. Um, they're really are nice. we supposed to be seeing anything? Oh, there we go. Okay. We're trying to get the other camera going. Oh, I got it. Okay, got it. Talking Dallas, or... I'm not having a lot of luck with that right now. But... Okay, well then I'll keep talking in this camera. Yeah. Okay, so um, I started out by buying uh, old socks like this, at swap meets and garage sales and so on. And, uh, most of them didn't work very well. And uh, I didn't know what they were. I had no idea what, you know, whether they were young, old, good quality, bad quality. And I think the best way to tell is to, is to actually use the saw, but there are a few guidelines you can use. Um, okay, so first I'm gonna talk about, I think, is that making sense? You got it? Okay, Japanese saws. Um, Japanese versus European. The, the primary difference is that Japanese saws tend to be fairly, what's the word, delicate instruments. Um, and when you buy one, it doesn't cost, buy a quality one, it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. You know, you can, for 50 bucks, you can buy a really nice saw. This, um, are, uh, Dallas, Dallas, we're just, I'm just guessing because you, um, are we supposed to be seeing through the other camera or I'm just trying to catch up on. Okay, are you seeing on. Paul right now? We're seeing Paul in the first camera, this, the original camera. Is that the way it should be? On this camera that I'm looking at right now. That's what we see, right? Yes, that's what, yeah. 
The one with my hand? The one that just showed your hand, yes. Yeah, man, I can't tell which camera I'm on. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, thanks. Okay, we'll get that result. Did that change it? That did, yes. Now, okay. Paul okay, looks so skinny. Now we're on the close shot. Okay, go ahead. We good? Okay. So this is, this is my favorite dovetail saw. I think it costs about 38 bucks. And I believe I bought it from, Chris, we were talking about Highland Woodworking. Um, I believe I bought it from them. I've, I've bought a few over the years. Um, when I took hand tool joinery, they taught us how to use a Japanese saw. Um, well, could you do us a favor and bring it real close to the camera so we can appreciate it? Um, oh, the, the, the saw? Yeah, just sure. so we can see what you're talking about. How's that? Oh, is yeah. That focus? Much, much better. Thank you. Okay. So this is a Japanese saw. And with a Japanese saw, you pull it towards you. You don't push it. Um, what I found, what I, I found trying all those blunt saws was that, um, that as I tried them, they tended to catch, they bent, and, and I would end up with, you know, the, the saws going sideways, my wood's getting ruined, and my hands are not happy. And I, that, that, that was a real problem. So the nice thing about Japanese saws is it seems to be a more natural motion to pull the saw towards you. So they have these little, these are actually called razor saws. And they have these little sharp teeth here that I kid you not, they are razors. They're like little tiny razors. If you ever accidentally, you know, let, cut through something and, and you've got a hand behind it, it'll, it'll uh, give you a nice little row of, of drops of blood. there. Um, um, so they come in a variety of, of different types. This is a, a, um, a dovetail saw, and they also come in crosscut and rip. For example, this is a Japanese style saw. I think I got it at Dixie Line. I was amazed. The first, this was the first Japanese type saw I got, where you pull the, the blade towards you, pull it towards you, and I was just amazed at what it does. Um, but it's got a crosscut on one side and a rip on the other, um, which I thought they were just big teeth and small teeth. <laughs> but it's actually set up once for ripping and once for cross cut. They cut their saws slightly differently in Japan. You'll often see that they, they'll have a couple of different bevels on them, on the wood, on the wood ones. Um, but these saws are incredibly sharp. They're worth treating like jewels and keeping very, very carefully. When you travel with them, they usually break down into half some way or another. This one uses a knob and this one uses a, uh, a clicking mechanism. Tell me, what do you see as a possible difference between these saws? Depth of cut? I'm sorry? The depth, depth of cut? cut? Not the cut. More rigid back. Take a look at the top end, top yeah. side. Of it. This one has a piece of steel that keeps it nice and straight. Really, really good for things like dovetails. I actually bought this as a dovetail saw and it works beautifully, but it's a little too heavy for a lot of what I'm doing. Um, this is a, without taking the, the cover off I, I, and, and wasting time, I, I, uh, I think this is a cross cut, but anyway, this is a saw that without the back saw, I can now go to whatever depth I want. I can saw through a piece of wood that's, you know, basically as, as, as long as I want. My, my set on the teeth will allow this thin, narrow blade to keep cutting through. But it's, it, so that's for sort of general joinery. And this is for more things like uh, <clears throat> and ten, or for tenons and for dovetails. You also have, this is a specialty Japanese saw. It is a flush cut saw. So you've got dowels in on your piece of wood and you want to cut them off as close as possible. Okay, you've got a little plane and you can, you can just plane them off afterwards or you can sand them or whatever, but you want to get as close as reasonably possible. This thing will go very, very close. It won't, it's not perfect. You need to make sure that you don't leave any scratches, but it has no, no um, step to it. So it's useless as a saw for cutting down through wood like this but it's really, really good for cutting things like dowels um, and flush 
to the surface. You can see other ones that you see people bending them up like that. I've had very little success with doing that technique. I tend to get try to get my saw off to the side so I can get it absolutely level with my piece of wood. But these are not expensive. They're 15 bucks or so, and, and they're, they're, they're really nice for, you know, you've got that piece, you've sanded it, you've just put it together, you put a dowel in, and, you know, now you want to cut it down rather than having to sand for 10 minutes or... What, what, was, what was that called again? It's called a flush cut saw. Thank you. You can even find them at, at Harbor Freight and they work. This one happens to be, I won't even try to pronounce it, but, but this one was actually made in Japan and, and you know, is, is, uh, I finally decided to get a slightly better quality one, but it was a difference of 10 bucks. So, um, that's the Japanese saw. Along those lines, this is a little saw. It's called a Zono saw. You can buy these in Dixie Line. I understand that uh, Bob Taylor of Taylor Guitars started out. This was one of the first saws that he used making his early guitars. They're about, with the little mitre box, they're about 17 bucks. Very, very, very small teeth. So it gives a very fine cut and a very fine edge cut. Most woodworkers will laugh at you if you produce one, but um, but they will work. And if you're on a budget, it's uh, it's a great little saw, um, especially if you just cut dovetails occasionally. Um, and you can, get, as I say, get a little miter box. This is the only kind of miter box I use. I find the regular ones are, are not worth bothering with. So Japanese saws. Okay, so the... Um, the European saws go the other way. The teeth are facing a different way and the action for a European saw is like this. I'll demonstrate in a little bit. This is um, one from England. It, as you can see, it's got a, a really solid back. It's a, I think it's a tenon saw. I'm not too, there are, there are so many different names for different saws. Uh, the slightly bigger ones are known as carcass saws. Um, this is a tenon saw. This is another one, could be a dovetail saw or a ten tenon saw. It's, it's French, it's got a lovely shiny brass back there. It's actually a French economy brand, but if this is their economy brands, then I'd love to see the quality. <laughs> 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 And so, and then I'll show you, okay, so this is one of my sharpening projects. I just, I bought this. I can show you the price. <laughs> it was at the wood, the, the, uh, the wood swap meet, and uh, the, the uh, old tool swap meet. I walked past it. I looked at it. I thought, no, it's not old. It's not American. I don't want it. And then I remembered that Sandvik are a very high quality product and that Swedish steel is in some ways even better than Sheffield steel. Um, so that uh, I bought it. And the guy tried, when I went back and I, I said, uh, you know, there you go, you've got a sticker on it for a dollar. He said, well, it's $5. I said, no, you've got a sticker on it, it's a dollar. So I got it for a dollar and I sharpened it up and it's, uh, it's just a beauty. Um, I do have a, a circular saw, but when I get large, like this piece of sycamore, I got in a 10 foot piece and I just can't get that through my bandsaw. I've got 15 inches on, or if I'm lucky, on the throat of my bandsaw. So anything large, I end up cutting with something like this. And uh, this guy is, um, is a ripper and uh, works really well. Things about rip saws, I should tell you, is that when you, if you're ever buying a rip saw or a crosscut saw, but especially a rip saw, you really want to have a tapered blade. I don't know if you can see it. It's actually marked taper ground the whole width. It's best Swedish charcoal steel. <laughs> so these black marks, but other than that, it's great. Um, but uh, uh, what was I saying? Um, yes, so, so this is just great for work like that. And as I do that kind of work, I usually try to square off a line and stick to it. 
And especially once you sharpen the saw up nicely, it's really easy to see. You mentioned about the taper grind. Sorry? You start talking about this taper oh, grind. Oh, I'm sorry, the taper grind. That deals with the same issue as, well, it deals with two issues. One is the, the same as the set, getting down into your piece of wood. Wood moves, as we all know. So as you get deeper into the wood, the taper grind there helps you, you know, it's narrower. It also reduces the weight of the saw. So, so this has to do with the tape, the way the, the, the width of the blade. Yes. Not so in the grind itself. It's in the... In the width of the blade. Okay. Yes. Not in, not, in, not in the... I'm sorry. Not in the grind of the teeth. No. I don't know if you can see, but you'll see it's thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. Hmm. By only a few thousandths, but it's... You want it to be nice and wide at the bottom here, and then if it tapers off, as it goes up, then it gives you a little bit more room to move. Plus, it reduces the weight of the saw. A non-tapered saw is fairly heavy. Um, and a lot of the older saws, that one uh, that I'll show you when I, when I demo, talk about uh, sharpening. Um, hey, Paul. Yeah. Paul. Yes. Just so you know, yeah. even though the video is excellent, we cannot detect a few thousandths of an inch change. Okay, yes, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> you mean you haven't got a visual micrometer right there in your shop? <laughs> a digital visual micrometer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very subtle difference. When I'm done with showing you how you sharpen it, I'll show you it more, obviously, and we'll see if you can. Let's measure it. I'll grab it. Yeah, um, I was measuring this the other day, and um, there is, there's a substantial difference. And if you look at it eyeball on, you can see. Well, I can see it. I don't yeah. know why you guys can't. You guys have better just take out Dallas's word for it. But anyway, you know, I love these $1 finds. I mean, they're, you know, same with old planes and such like that. You know, and here's the thing that I like about European saws is I can, saw, I can resharpen this saw and use it time and time and time again. And there's no reason why a good saw shouldn't last a lifetime in the hands of someone who can, who can sharpen them. And these old craftsmen you see as all the time you know, before the days of the portable mechanical saws. Um, but, uh, yeah, so they're, 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 the other thing is that a person who does very specific work can sharpen the saw to exactly how they want it. You know, so um, there, are, there, there are all sorts of variations. Some of the more expensive dovetail saws that you are available now actually have a change in the amount of teeth per inch as they go up to the center and then back in to the bottom. Um, but I, it's my belief that you don't need a $150 saw to do, to, to do really good dovetails. It's nice to have the thing, but, but uh, you know, there's some really nice saws on the market, but they're almost all expensive because a cheap saw is just that. And, and, and there's not a market for really good saws anymore. So um, they don't, uh, they don't uh, sell them. So depending on what you're doing with a saw, you, you know, you can, you can um, do heavy work, you can do light work. Obviously there are saws that two people can work with. Chris was showing us a, 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 an old style saw that was used a lot in the past by cabinet makers just before the, the meeting started and perhaps he'll show it to us again. Um, but uh, you look at some of those things and they look a little Heath Robinson, but when you actually get into them, they were made for a long time and they were used for a long time. And they, I'm finding more and more some of these old tools are just really, really nice tools. Um, so anyway, I better move on because I've been talking about, oh, another type of saw. This is, any of you, any of you guys have scroll saws? Do you recognize the arm of the scroll saw here? This is known as a fret saw. Cabinet makers use it. The nice thing about it is you can drill a hole in a piece of wood, you can take a blade out and put it back in, and then you can work, and because it's a very fine blade, it's actually, I think, a scroll saw blade, um, you can you can work. This is how old old, old uh, craftsmen either did marquetry or just cut holes in pieces of wood or whatever. So this is this is one kind. I have not mastered the use of this. I find that it's a little unbalanced. But 
wow, I can get this far into a piece of wood and, I can, and, and then saw out a shaped hole. And, you know. How would a cabinet maker use that? Uh, if they were doing a pierced carving, something of that nature. Um, I uh, can't imagine that, uh, that you would use it all the time, but if you needed to go really far into, say, the middle of a door or something, sure. maybe a keyhole, cut a keyhole, something like that. There you go. Um, but uh, you might also use a jeweler's saw. And if any of you guys have experience of this, I'm having a real problem. This Maybe I've just got a, a, a not very well-made saw, but whenever I try to use this, I find that the, the blade bends up like that, and I just cannot keep it straight. So um, it sits there, and I think it's waiting for the day when I replace it with something that actually works. But, <laughs> but you know, it's it's Maxon brand, and it's made in the USA. So I wonder if maybe the this operator error rather than that. Than manufacturer error. And then here's the one I use the most. I use this for plastic. I use this for um, dovetails. I, I use it, uh, you know, whenever I do dovetails. I've, I've tried different methods, and this one is, you know, it gives me the balance between accuracy and quickness um, to at least get down to to uh, to close to to where I need to be. And we'll we'll go go down that route in a, in a short while. Um, so uh, this is, these, just like any other product, vary very much in quality. I don't think I've got the good ones. I think this one is like a twenty-dollar one. But you, there are ones that have a, uh, they're very light, made of aluminum, aluminum, and they have a sort of a pierced lattice work frame, and they're over a hundred dollars. And I, you know, they're, 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 they're probably wonderful, wonderful tools, but but. Um, I don't know, part of the joy of hand tools is not having to spend thousands of dollars on, on, on equipment, you know, even though I do. <laughs> some of you, well, if not hundreds, some of you might have seen before, might have used before, is a veneer saw. So this is a little saw, it's got teeth on both sides, but I've covered up the teeth. Um, but just like any other saw, when I got it, I, it had to be tuned up. So. The bottom has been flattened at least around the edges, and then had to um, put a bevel on the, on the saw teeth there. And uh, I took a, or started taking, I had to drop out, but I started taking a veneer class with Chance, who is kind of legendary in the veneer world. Um, and uh, this is the kind he recommended buying, and, set, and this is the way to set it up. But like like all hand tools, you, you, if you learn to set it up, it works better for you, and you, and you never have to worry about going out and buying a new one, unless you really do some damage. So, dovetail and sharpening. Let's let's talk about um, sharpening. Can we move up to the other thing? I will give it my best shot here. Did that change the view, Travis? Yes. It did. And if you could get really closer when he's doing it, that would be really appreciated. Oh, yeah. You're, you're going to sharpen now? Um, well, I'm going to gonna talk about principles of sharpening. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So, ready to go. If you won't need to be terribly close up. So, um, I kind of detailed the steps that you do. But when you, when you sharpen a saw, just like um, anything else, you want to start with something to register from. And you want to ensure that when you sharpen, that you don't sharpen to different depths and put your teeth in all kinds of different spots. So the very first thing you do is totally counterintuitive. I can't do it in this homemade saw vise. Incidentally, you can I'm looking for one, but you can you can buy a, a steel vice that does it really elegantly. This is a homemade vice from a fine woodworker um, uh, article, uh, and you know with with the addition of a couple of clamps and so on, it actually works very well. But the very first thing that I'm going to do is take a bastard mill file, and this is this is. Uh, you, you might also recognize it from jointing something else as well. Yes, card scrapers. 
Um, I use it for my card scraper as well. It's just, uh, I cut a little groove in here and I fit, a, fit my file in there. And then I go and I, I put it along the tips of the teeth and, and take them until I can see a little shine on all of the teeth. It may be maybe a 32nd to a 16th of an inch, depending. The important thing is to go down to, to where you've got all the teeth. And the nice thing about this, this saw, for example, is an old uh, saw that I found, in, again, in the back of a closet here in the shop. And these teeth look like the gently rolling hills of Montana rather than the Rocky Mountains. And um, I, I took it home, de-rusted it, uh, you know, took the handle off, cleaned it up and so on, and then sharpened it. And the very first thing I did was to take and I had to work a little at this because you want them to be reasonably straight in that line. And, and, you, and some of these teeth were kind of worn out. There's a missing tooth up the front here. It's a good idea to look at the teeth back here if you want to know what your profile is because they have rarely cut anything. <laughs> so this, if you're thinking, what kind of a shape did these teeth have? Look at the ones up under the handle. And they'll probably tell you what it is. So the very first thing that you do is you do that joint. In fact, I'm sorry. There's one more. One thing you do that before that is you do the set. You 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 actually take the saw. There's an older tool that depended on the skill. This is a skill-free, relatively skill-free tool. So what I did with these old beat-ups, what I did with these old, old beat-up saws was I actually returned the t all of the teeth to the upright and then I put the set in because they were all over the place. So I just went along here and what, what the set is, it has, I don't know if it focuses that close, but it mm. has a little piece there. That piece down there contacts the edge of the tip of the tooth and pulls it over and there's a there's a bevel there and how far up or down the bevel it goes is how oh. far you're going to put the set. I've never seen that. So hey it, Paul? It, yes. Just because the focus on this has been pretty darn good, can you just try getting it really close and let's just see how close you can get because it's been focusing pretty nicely. A little higher so we can actually see it in the camera. Yeah, I mean, it's not no, perfectly in focus it. there, but we can really get the gist of it right there. No, it yeah, that right there, you can see just great. That's good. Yeah. Do you see that yeah. little? So this side is the anvil, and this is, I don't know what it's called. But anyway. Yeah, but the hammer does, is, uh, yeah, you can see it acting. And you can see that little bevel? Yes. And you adjust that bevel there to move it up and down for how much of a set you want on the saw. So again, if you're cutting, just rough cutting, then put lots of set on it. Not too much, you don't want too much, but put a good set on it. If you're dovetailing, you want a minimal set to it. The, the important, most important thing is consistency, which is why this machine is so good for that. Because once you've got it set up, and what you do basically, once you've got it set up, it, it works really well. And you basically, you do every other teeth on one side, turn it over and do every other tooth on the other side. And that way, if you've ever looked Wait, let me see if I got a better saw for that particular one. What is this tool called? It's called a set, a saw set. Okay. I don't know if you can see the set on that on the teeth of those, but if you look down the row, I can't see it. You can't really see it. I don't know if you can see. Can you see close up like that? Can you see? Better. Can you see that the teeth are going two ways? Yes, we could go a little further back. Just it's out of focus right there. There. So about seven there inches is our focal length for that minimum focal length. Okay. So you could you, maybe you can. Can you see that? And it's not very pronounced because this is for fairly fine work. But there's a, just a little set. So you basically you run along, and everything that you do, sharpening, using the set. Everything you do, every other one, turn the saw around and do every other one. And there's a, a very good reason for that, especially when you come to sharpen, um, which I'll explain in a minute. But um, so anyway, does does that make it clear about the set? 
Yes, I struggled you. with understanding yes. this stuff for years. And okay, you've made it simple for me. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm a simple soul. <laughs> so, um, so anyway. Um, Paul. Yes. Question. Yes. Uh, sometimes, as you know, in bandsaw blades, there are variations on a theme of, of the set. Uh, yes. you know, two teeth per inch uh -huh. and this and that. Is there any situation with a handsaw where that would apply? In other words, uh, teeth two first. teeth one side, two teeth the, the next two the other way, et cetera, or anything like that? Does that ever happen? Or not. I've never seen a saw set up like that. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I, I'd have to do it to find out what, what the uh, but I don't see what the advantage would be for for this kind of saw. I know with bandsaw blades that's a whole other world that I'm having a, a hard time understanding it. But but you know because you've got the teeth per inch and you've got the shape of the gullet and you've got the, so the big thing there with bandsaws is how you get rid of the, the material because exactly. it's going so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's true. It's, Yes, and that is something that I've had to learn with hand saws is to slow down because I'm so used to seeing saws cut really fast. And these are not designed to do that. These things work best at a human pace. And I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, oh, let's get it done kind of person. So I tend to go at things with a, at a ferocious pace. Japanese and the European saws, it's better to relax let the saw do the work and take your time. That gives the blade enough time to actually cut the wood. And I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Um, so anyway, uh, any further questions about the set? So this is the first thing you do in sharpening your blade. So immediately we've set it up so that there's one thing is consistent is we've got our Two things consistent actually we've got our, 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 our blade um, set consistent on both sides and we've got our tooth size set to be the same and that we're going to go go into into how we get get to that tooth sizes being the same so um, so there's a set so now we've got two things set up the next thing that we're going to do is actually sharpen the saw set it up in a saw vise, and this is a rip saw. So this is the difference in, shall, shall I turn this to I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna the, hold on until you guys have a visual. Yeah, Pete, on that, on that issue of, 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 of um, the way you set the teeth up, I, I do know that the old time craft people used to set up their, their saws for very specific purposes and, and they would keep them in that shape for themselves. So, um, and, and it might be, uh, it may be no great mystery. It may be that just a bit like muscle memory with sharpening a plane, that just having the same person sharpen the same tool all the time means that it gets consistently sharpened at the right angle. But I'll, first of all, I'll show you the difference between, there we are, that's, now you use triangular file, it's gonna be tapered or it should be tapered. And there are various different file set sizes for different blades. Um, it's not critical, but the smaller, the finer the blade, the, the closer you ought to be on it. So a rip cut is, I'm literally trying to, to cut it so that I've got a chisel on top here. So the rip cut, I'm going to usually, usually a saw blade doesn't get too messed up because once it goes dull, people don't use it anymore. They either slam it into something and bend the saw, and you do need to have a straight saw, or they just quit using it, which means that usually something like two to three files like that will do it. The important thing is to see it shiny, and I'll explain some more of the fine detail there. You then, you work your way up the saw, I'll move the saw in the vise there to get the rest of it up. I might even have to take the handle off in order to work it, but I'll, I'll work every other one. I, as I was mentioning earlier, work all the way up to here, then I turn the saw around and work every other one the same way the opposite way. What that does 
is it gives you a consistency in the angles that you're using. Um, because if you just start here and you go one, one kept blade, one blade, one blade, you're, you're actually kicking each one of these blades out. You know, there, there's a little friction there. You're kicking each blade out. So what's going to happen is if all of your blades are kicked slightly that way, the saw is going to tend to, to curve as it cuts. So in order to cut straight, you want to have that consistency and sharpening. So we turn it around and come back and do every other side. And there's, there's more to it than that. So, so I, Paul, Paul, yes. Um, yes. Just, to, just to be very clear, what you just said. So you are you are attempting to create a V in each groove, which has a, which has a face that is, let's say, the edges are perpendicular to the length of the saw, right? In other words, you want perpendicular. Uh, angles of the of the blade edge is that is that accurate? Yes, yes. In the case of a rip saw, yes. Yeah, a rip saw. Okay. With a cross cut saw, I'm sorry, I did not demonstrate that. With a cross cut saw, the angle's closer to this, and the key to that is you can actually feel it if you if you use your file, you can feel where the edges are, and then as you draw the file through you'll see where you got shiny and where you didn't get shiny, and then you can adjust your angle. But yeah, the, the, the rip cut is just making the tips of these blades chisel-like, and then the cross cut is making them more knife-like by doing that. Mm. So okay. does that make it any clearer? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm now going to move on and go to the uh, whiteboard. Are we good? And I'm going to give you, show you my visual representation of what we do in this. So we flatten all the tops off the. the uh, so, so here's the uh, form representation of the saw blade. It doesn't actually. It's not just a straight triangle like that. It's actually a triangle that's kicked off. That's an exaggeration, but. But. Basically, this is this is the forward direction, and it's the tip on this more cute angle, as opposed to the this is this is behind the tip, this is in front of the tip. So we've taken the tips off the blade, which now gives us something to work to because what we want to do is we want to file it until. We go one, down one side of the blade and we file it until we've taken, this is called a land, this flat object. Called what? A land, L-A-N-D. Hmm. And you basically, you file half of the land off going up one side of the saw, turn it around and file the other half there. So here we're doing every other one and what results is we'll have a sharp tip as, as, I, as I turn it around, so yeah, I, I got my got a little confused. So you see, these lands are longer than here. So when I've gone all the way up, filing with my triangular file across here, I've taken half the land off, taken half of it off here, taken half of it off here. Turn the, turn the saw around and take that other half off there and there, and so on. And now I've got nice sharp teeth again, this demonstrates it, and we get to the sharp teeth. So it's not, it's not that some old craftsperson sits there and just knows exactly how those tips are supposed to be. There's a method to it. And if you follow that method, it's a pretty simple method. The difference between the two is you do exactly the same, up one side of the saw, down the other, and you do it with a cross cut, you just do it at a sharper angle. So as far as I can see, the big differences are really with a smaller saw, such as this one, you use a smaller file. So I've got smaller files that I just picked up at garage sales and so on over the years. If you're looking at old files, don't buy the ones from India. Get American files and look to see that they have some 
edge on them because they, they, they wear out, especially doing saw blades. One reason the blade is set so far down is because it chatters as you run your file across. If, you, if, if your blade is chattering or screaming, it's not going to be sharp and it's going to ruin your file. So you want to hold it really firmly. I've done, done several just using my vices at home. You don't need a saw vice. You just have to be a little um, creative in terms of how you, how you do it. But, you know, if you see that, that saw vice and the shipping is only $5 and it's on eBay for 25 get it. <laughs> okay, so this I thought was just a complete lost cause. This is one, another one that I found in a drawer in the shop. And I thought, what the hey, I'm going to take it home because actually the blade is pretty straight. And the teeth were in terrible shape. Some of them were completely missing. So I did a kind of a, a partial get there. And you can see that those teeth are in pretty, you know, they're pretty variable. This is not a, 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 an example of a master craftsman's work. This is, <laughs> this is, this is, this is but what I will do is over several sharpenings, I'll join it each time and we'll slowly get back to the, the teeth. I just didn't want to take the time because I was sort of trying to get ready for this. But anyway, this is a little dovetail saw. It's made by a company called R.H. Davis, who I think were, were bought out or were a subsidiary of Diston. But it's got all the, the aspects of a, of, a, of a dovetail saw that you need, a nice or not that you need. One of them, the other nice things about the European blades is they're heavier, they're thicker. So if you're doing super, super fine dovetails, you really do want a Japanese saw. But as long as you've got room enough to get, you know, like three thirty seconds of room between the tip of your dovetails, you can you can get in and use this. The rigidity on the push, and I'll demonstrate that in a, in, in a minute. But I've, I've cut a few dovetails with this crap little saw. And I'm going to put it in the, in the shop and people can abuse it and I'll take it home in a few months of sharpening it. But, but um, we have a fairly poor selection of saws in the shop, but we're going to improve it. Anyway, so the next thing, I guess, uh, are there any, I know I covered saw sharpening in a very, very short time, but have you guys got any questions at this point? Uh, well, yes. One quick, quick question. <laughs> Basically, you, you are saying that you get a saw and the manufacturer has given you the set and everything and the, and the angles, and you're just repeating that. You're not changing the angle because you want to make it sharper or anything like that. And when you, when you first set the, um, the, the depth of the angle, you go to yeah. the handle end and find out what the angles of the uh, saw is right at the unused end and then go back. So you're, you're just copying what the original manufacturer did with the saw. Am I complaining? Yes. Yes. With the exception that um, you may, as, as, as an experienced craftsman, you may find that slightly different angles work. But for people like me, just taking us, if I bought a new saw, I would use it until it, I felt it was going dull. And then, yes, I would imitate exactly the same set. In fact, you don't need to set a saw every time you use it, um, you know, every time you sharpen it. Um, it's, which can, I'm speaking with this camera. Right? Um, it's, it's not something you have to do every, every time, but if you're finding your saws not working very well, it's a good thing to, uh, to get covered. Um, and, uh, but, but the, in terms of the, uh, of the manufacturer's angles, yeah. If you're happy with the saw, all you got to do is get that 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 um, triangular file in there, feel the angle, and then see it by putting gently pushing. And you you use these files gently. You don't you know. You just use it gently. Um, but uh, you uh, yeah, you'll feel where it is. And then if you just do one gentle file through, you can see where you've. Brought up, brought up right metal, and then adjust your angle of cut. And then once you've set up that angle, I just try, I almost kind of lock my body in place and just try to do the same thing each time. And if necessary, I'll go back to the one I've cut in order to set my angle again to my body. But it's, um, 
you know, it, it's not like a plain blade where there's going to be a huge difference in, you know, it, and we're not trying to get a, a, a clean, smooth surface. So there's a little bit more wiggle room, but, but I tell you the difference between a, a, uh, a saw that uh, does work well and one that doesn't is, is night and day. Oh, one question I've got yes. is, how is the sharpening difference between a cross cut and a rip saw? We're doing the same thing for both of them? Essentially the same thing. The only difference is the angle of, across the saw that you use. Yes. But absolutely, yes. So if I had a rip saw and I wanted to change it to a, if I wanted to change this to a cross cut saw, I could just change. Can you see? Um, we're gonna need it in a moment anyway, so. Oh, that's another thing. There is another use for a saw. They can be played. <laughs> no, I have a, 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 an album by, I can't remember the name of the band. But they're, they're of course out of Texas, and they 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 see a great song called Dallas, and they just play that song all the way through. But um, yes, so to get to so that's that's your rip across there. If I wanted to turn this into a cross cut, I would just change the way you hold your file. Yeah, exactly. So it's the angle across the file. So across here, what happens is as you file. The back of one tooth, you're filing in front of another as you go through. And that's why you use the B. It's slightly, as you cut, it's slightly offset. Right. But that's the difference from what I've read. I haven't tried converting one yet, but <laughs> they, you, you know, even if you don't get a chance to go to the old tool swap meet, I've got some great clients at Kobe swap meet. You go in, they have no idea what they got sitting there. I found like victim files for a dollar fifty and stuff, and they were just really uh, nice. Okay, so I'm going to finish up with a quick, very quick demo of cutting dovetails. So I think I'm going to have to cut it fairly short, so I'm not going to do the chisel punch whenever you want. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to point at that. There, and I'll be on this side. So. Okay, so what I really wanted to do was just show you a couple of things, how easy it is to cut dovetails. And Alice? Uh, yeah. In, does that camera have a zoom? No. Oh, okay. No, it's just my phone. Okay. Oh, oh it's your phone. Okay. Now, because I was taught by it's someone, huh? We're trying to yeah. Because I was taught by a uh, hand tool joinery by someone who's really um, does some very fine work. Um, she taught us how to do it to to a pretty high high standard. And I, I'm not up to that standard yet. <laughs> but she was, she taught, she said, basically, you know, dovetails, you don't need these for strength. They don't need to be this good for strength. But if you're doing fine woodwork, then you really want to do it. So you'll notice that the entire dovetails are all marked out with a knife. I used, I usually use this guy as I can flip it over and work it right and left handed. Um, and, you know, I use a dovetail marker to mark it all out, but the entire dovetail is marked out. The only thing that I blew on this was that I marked a knife line along the entirety of both sides. Normally, I like the outside not to have any maker's marks, as it were. A lot of people it like that line to be there. I, I, what I'm going to do, if, if, if I were to do this, I'd be shaving a little bit off the edge anyway, so I'd get rid of that line. But mark out the whole thing. That achieves two things. It shows me absolutely clearly where I'm going to be cutting. I've, and, I, and then I mark out where my waist is by just uh, putting a, a pencil mark on it. And then cutting this, marking it with a knife like this, cuts, cuts the 
brain so that it enables it two things. It gives me a really good point to start. It's cut through the fibers here, and it enables me to start my saw really close to my line. So this saw, which looks like looks like a mountain range, literally. Um, you know, the, the teeth are so rough, um, but watch what you can do. So usually I'll set up at the angle. I like to get, get my saw going in two planes here, the, the angle of the dovetail and this, this uh, um, nice 90 degree angle here. And having cut it, what happens is the saw just goes nicely. Relax, stop, relax, stop, relax. I go close to, but not on the line. Now, if I accidentally start my curve maybe a little far away from the line, it's not the end of the world. What I don't want to do is what I just did there, which is to have my saw jump, and it jumped and it damaged a little bit of the tail. There. So now I always cut my tails to stick out a little bit anyway, so I'll be able to take that off. But that's not, not, not a good practice. And that, what, what had happened there was I got my curve slightly inside of the line. So I'm going to go with that curve that's inside the line. Probably compensate for it now. But also, having a nice clean line on this bottom side tells me where to stop. So that's where the European beat up old saw that hasn't been loved for a long, long time. Now, this is with the, the Japanese saw. As I said, I just, I love these smells. I love the Europeans because of their ability to recycle. These things. So, one reason I've got this set up is because I don't actually have a proper vice like this. So, you know, I want to show you that even if you just have a, a, a large wooden table to work off, you get yourself something like a hand screw and a couple of clamps and you can you can basically set up a vice. Oh, it hurts a lot smaller on that one. It's a lot smaller, yeah. yeah. Hey, and and, Paul, and, oh, yes? Do you use anything for uh, lubricating the saw blade, beeswax or something else to make it go uh, properly? So, yes. I do indeed, <laughs> and I just happen to have a can of it here. This is um, beeswax dissolved in mineral springs. This is what I use. A candle would do it just as well, but yeah, you just, it, it, it has two functions. It, it, it gives you a nice smooth surface to the steel, and it's got a little bit of rust protection. Beeswax doesn't seem to damage wood joints. I'll only put it on when I when I begin to feel some resistance because um, if I don't need to put it on, there doesn't seem any point in putting residual little bits of wax on the on the piece. But yeah, I think as a, a starter woodworker, I I I really like the Japanese sauce because you get good results from those immediately. So that nasty noise is my is my is the metal parts of my vice or something around which you do get a lot of vibrations and that's often a clue to uh, ease up. This actually this is a nice way to cut these things out because with each cut you can see exactly where you're going. You're going off. But if you just back and forth furiously, which I used to do. can get pretty close to the line there. Obviously, if you go through the line, then you have to make sure that the piece you went through the line on is on the inside of your piece instead of the outside. Okay, so now I've done two dovetails, one with a Japanese saw and 
one with a, an English saw, as it were, American saw. So this is what I usually do for dovetails. I've got this guy set up Japanese style, so it's a backward cut. And I'll, I'll set that baby in up here. I gotta be careful that I don't knock off that real sharp edge of the dovetail. So it might go, even go a little further in than that. The other thing about relaxing is you don't get your soul jumping around. So I'm cutting down to or close to my corner there. Japanese saw also gives just a beautiful edge there. And then I'll take my saw and get it down as low as I reasonably can. So I could have just smashed one of my dovetails off. So um, that's something I have to be careful of. So I did a real deep cut here. I usually cut a little finer. Oh, I'm sorry. I did a real uh, deep. I mean, I, I left a lot of waste there. Normally, I don't leave as much. Um, but that's easy enough to chisel out. The way I was actually taught to do it was to cut this, cut a couple of um, relief saw cuts in there and then chisel it out. But I find, first of all, I don't like using a mallet with a chisel. I, 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 I use my shoulders or my body weight if I'm, if I'm gonna do that. And, and that's just great. But I really, you know, especially with dovetails, I don't like to get a hammer anywhere near it because it's so easy to bruise the grain and, and dovetails are all about having a nice sharp glue line to see. So um, I was gonna demo cutting these out, but you can see I've done a couple and they come out, they're close. They're not perfect, but they're close. Um, and if, once you get in the habit of these, they don't take a lot, long time. They, it takes more time to mark, mark them out and to, uh, and to uh, you know, get everything set up than it does to actually do the cuts. And um, these may not be perfect, but once I've done the cuts, because I have, the marking lines everywhere. If I'm inside, the, as long as I've stayed inside the line, then I'm good. But for example, one of those cuts I did just now was a little too far in here. So I'll just take a chisel and take that little bit off. But the nice thing about cutting the tails first is if you cut too much, you're gonna mark the pins to your tails. You don't use a dovetail um, marker to get those. And having this, just these sharp lines that cut the grain, they really just make a world of difference. I, I, I hate using pencil only for dovetails. Um, but uh, they're fun to do, and if people see you doing them, they, they always comment on it. <laughs> um, uh, I don't personally, I, you know, I do, I've, I've been making a lot of draws with dovetails so I can improve my skill, but quite honestly, it, it, for the, uh, unnecessary strength gained in most of the furniture I have. I, I, our dovetails are unnecessary except just for fun. But um, there's other ways to put a draw together that are, that are just as strong and actually look pretty clean if you're not gonna look at them. Um, I think that's about it in terms of that. Um, what I would like to do is uh, ask if you guys have any projects that you'd like to talk about, have to show us. And uh, and uh, all questions. Paul, I just had a thought, which was yes, over here. To have an opportunity sometime when we can get back to normal in the shop, for us to actually have a hands-on where maybe there are two or three stations and we can learn the different angles for uh, drawing a rip versus a cross cut. Uh, uh, the file on the teeth of the yeah. saw, we bring our own saw in. I mean, something to make it real would 
as a as a hands-on exercise would really be great. So it's just oh. a suggestion that down the road that would be a fun Saturday morning kind of activity because I've been intrigued by a lot of what I've seen and I, I want to try it, but it would really have been nice to have had a guided first try. And if we could came in that way and maybe we all purchase a certain set of files or something in advance, uh, it would be a really fun way to spend a, an hour or so, I think. Hey, absolutely, yes. I've been thinking along the same lines myself. I thought we might have a, because I, I, I've had several people say to me, uh, I've got this old plane at home that I've had for 20 years or 10 years or whatever, and I just never got it right. And I thought we thought of having a plane workshop I thought we could have an edge tool sharpening workshop and I think a saw sharpening workshop would be good, especially if there's anyone out there who knows more about it than I do, because, you know, I, I can show you what I know, but I can't always answer the in-depth questions. And doing some dovetails would be a fun one, too. Sorry? Yeah. Doing some and dovetails would be a good one. Oh, yeah, dovetails would be another good one. We've got a rich plethora of material to work on. Paul, here's one thought. Uh, to add to what we've just discussed, which is what if we time them right after an old tool swap meet, but told people in advance that that's what we'd be doing. So at the swap meet where we have our table, we could also be saying, and by the way, next weekend for any saws you have, we've got this workshop. And the subsequent one, hey, any, any, um, chisels you have come on in and we're going to do a workshop it would also serve a marketing role and we have a really great outlet in all the hundreds of people who come to the old tool swap meet so marrying all these ideas together could produce some interesting results for us yeah yeah those are some really good possibilities i'm uh, yeah no i i i uh, I've, I've got some really good deals at the old tool swap meet and uh, and you're right a lot of people like me just don't know this stuff until they learn it and and um and there's not you know i mean i i, I have been looking for probably three or four years for somebody to teach me how to shop sharpen saws and uh, and uh, eventually i went to a book so most of my learning is book learning <laughs> Yeah, which of course is different from actually a guided mentoring uh, procedure. When you were talking about everybody has old saws around, I, I looked around where I'm sitting and I saw like seven or eight saws that I probably have never given decent treatment of because yeah. of difference. And yet I have lots that I could use in a workshop to get a feel for. So I, I don't know, I'm kind of excited about the idea of a hands-on and uh, I look forward to that. I think it's the logical extension of what we're doing now. As soon as we're able to do it in a, you know, in an appropriate and safe manner, I, I'm all for it because, uh, yeah, the, the hand tool, hand tool skills can be passed on by hand tool workers. Yeah. Hey, Dallas, can we switch cameras? Because we're looking at the corner of the room. You are. Are you not looking at Paul? Oh, you haven't. Been, I, I thought I was talking to you guys all this time. We, we're sure you're gesticulating, and we're appreciative of that, but. We didn't see it. <laughs> is, is that showing Paul now? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd be all up for it. I mean, a general tool restorative session, like you say, after the old tool swap beat, because uh, uh, I mean, planes, chisels, hammers, saws, all that kind of hand tool stuff. And if you get an old rusty piece of junk, may still be a gem if yeah. given the proper TLC. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, I guess I'd be open to that and then we could subdivide if necessary. But I'd also, you know, I think there's a lot of people just have some of these tools laying around in their homes. And if nothing right. else, they could find out whether it's something they should just pass on to the thrift store or, or, or hold on to as a tool. And, and that's all a matter of, you know, how picky you are. Really. Oh, oh, Paul, with your accent and all these old, you could have an, this old tool a new show for PBS and people would bring them in and you'd say where it's from and what its <laughs> legacy is and how much it's worth on the market today. <laughs> well, as I, as I haul out a $5 bill for, a, for an 1850 infill plane. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 if you put in a learn a few skills and put in a, a, a little patience, you can you, you can really do 
the, the, you know, you can get some of the very finest tools on, on the used market. You know? I'll, uh, next next, uh, next uh, event we have, I'm going to bring in one of mine that uh, I just got this week. It's, it's a doozy. It's, um, it's an infill plane. And uh, when I bring it in, I'll tell you guys a little bit about infill planes. But they, they represent the absolute uh, peak of, of plane making um, mm. from Scotland in the 1850s through about the 1920s. That'd be improved. And uh, um, I, I bought one this week. Uh, well, I bought it a couple of weeks ago, but it had to come, oddly enough, from Scotland. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm restoring it. <laughs> Greg Weiss is, is giving me advice as to how to restore it, but... I've already tried it, and it, it's just, I, I, I see what people were talking about. That's great. 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 Okay, well, any other projects? Nobody? Nobody got anything that they want to do, that they want to talk about? All right. You want to hear about my, you want to hear about my camera mount that's being 3D printed for my laser cutter? Yes? No? Just kidding. That sounds like a hand tool project, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then bring it in, we'll soar it down to size. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, all right, so um, two sessions ago, as we, as we packed up, Gary and, um, and uh, Doug came in. They, they'd been to a, a place down in National City run by a partner of ours called Lumber Cycle, and they had a whole bunch of locally grown lumber that um, you know came from people's backyards, from streets, from parks, and you know, trees that had to come down anyway. And uh, Tom of Lumber Cycle has a grant for basically sawing this stuff up and recycling and, and cycling it so that it can be used rather than put in the landfill. And I, I've, been, I've known Tom for years and I, I called him up and said, and said, hey, you've got some nice stuff down there. Can I come and and uh, get some from you. So I went down there and I was kind of at a loss for what to do, but a neighbor had asked me to make an end table, a little um, yeah, end table for her, um, a, a kind of mid-century that actually in ash. And that was really nice, but it was, it was my own design, but I wasn't happy with it. So I, I also had this huge piece of sycamore. And uh, it was, I don't know, 15 feet wide. This is one piece of sycamore, just one single piece. I didn't glue several pieces together. Wow. And one of the challenges of working with sycamore is it, it changes enormously across the, um, you know, across one, one trunk. This was close to the center of the trunk, the pith. I think there's a little of the pith there and there's a little of the pith there. So it's as close to quarter sawn as you will ever get. But I wanted to put some curves on the underside as yeah. well. So I carved a bunch of curves there. And then, of course, once I carved, I, I then thought about how do I get the legs in here? And I'd originally planned to actually um, to set a mortise and tenon down in wood and, and carefully put shoulders and so on, but getting your shoulders so they take up this curve is nigh on impossible. And you, you'd have to be a genius to get it right. So what I did was I just, I, I said, okay, let's have a shoulderless tenon. So I drilled down into, you know, cause I got one flat surface here. I used a, a, a I did use a, a, a drill press. So I've drilled everything to the same depth and then set these on and marked it out and then oh, cut down into very it. Cool. But it gave me, and then I did something similar with the saddle joint here. But, um, but it, it's, it, it just, it, I really like the clean. That's, that's a remarkable project. I like that. I, and and uh, sycamore is just such a fun piece of wood because it, it, it's just all over the place in terms of, of pattern and huh. color. And, and so it's very challenging to actually make a, a piece of furniture that, 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 that doesn't look odd because you get all these changes of color and so on. But my love for sycamore originates when I did my first, my 100 class. You might have noticed that I, I, I have a, 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 an accent that, that doesn't come from these shores. And I walked into the urban lumber room and there was a big stack of London plain, which is a beautiful tree. 
and uh, we need to pack this up. So, <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, it's it's a very popular tree in 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 London, and I had no idea what the wood was like. But I, I've sort of uh, I've done a few pieces with 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 sycamore, sycamore, and I really like to use the the uh, the effect for um, for draw fronts and such like. I think that I've, I've already shown one piece of uh, sycamore draw, draw fronts, but uh, it's it's a real fun wood. Um, but uh, you know, you you sort of got to work with what you have rather than have a concept and build to that. You know. But uh, anyway, that's that was my project to get me out of the I don't want to do woodwork problem. <laughs> <laughs> so on the underside of that, was that just a lot of draw knife? and plane work to get those soft curves? I saw him in here on the CNC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it was. It was uh, mostly spoke shave and uh, uh, the draw knife is a little too uh, unwieldy with this shape of, of wood, but, uh, but I could put this with a little of the edge sticking out the edge of the bench and work it with a spoke shave. And, and I do use planes a lot because I find that, you know, block planes in particular work really well on curves and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was just, just hand tools. And the finish is, uh, I, you know, this, I have a 12 inch Ryobi planer, which is not very good at the best of times, but this finish is a hand plane finish. So um, yeah, this all goes along with my attempt to put 3M out of business by not buying their product. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work, but it'll make me happier. Because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just finding that that, that plain or hard straight finish is, is more rewarding to work with. All righty. Any other comments, suggestions? Um, I, with regard to the in-house thing, I think that would be just great as long as soon as we can find a way to set it up. You know? I'm sure it's you know we're going to be. Um, Progressing on this whole COVID nineteen thing in a, in a, a uh, what's the word? Not in a huge rush, I'm sure. Paul, this All was right. a fabulous session. Really great. Anything else? So next time, sorry, I, my mind's gone blank. I had a whole sub set of subjects for next time. But yeah, next time, what are you going to do? Um, I, I, I. I I thought we might double back to planes because it is an essential part of our work and we can go through and make some of the different kinds of planes and, and talk to them. Um, but for future things that I'd like to do, I'd really like to do um, marking out tools, for example. I think that would be really good and, we're, and um, you know, that's something marking out, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on it. And hole drilling tools of various kinds. Um, I thought of uh, doing one on that. Um, and but what type of tool? Whole thing tools that you know braces and bits oh, and, yeah, yeah. and drills the egg beater drills mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and such like. I don't have a much of a selection of tools with that, but but, um, but uh, I do I do use my um, brace and bit quite a lot, especially for oh. things like uh, drilling holes on my bench. <laughs> hey Paul, just right. out of curiosity. Hey, yes. You've you've been doing the first and third Saturdays, but the first Saturday of July is July fourth. We probably wouldn't get much of an audience. Yeah. So, Not unless we invite them here for a barbecue. <laughs> We'd have to get that by the shop director first. <laughs> Good luck on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I can't be here. I... <laughs> 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 Selfish motivation. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll get back so, to you on that. I just wanted to let you know. No, I, I, I think though, when we. I'm sorry, please go ahead. Yes, we can either do it. I, I don't know if we have an extra Sunday next month, but we could either do it like that or, um, you know, go do every other week, whatever, whatever works really. Okay, yeah, I'll talk to you separately, but uh, the, the Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Well, we take a look at the calendar and we'll announce it. Yeah, and we've been alternating Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. between a digital thing and a hand tool thing. So that's the only thing I wanted to point out. We've got this 4th of July thing in the way, that's all. We can figure it out. Okay. Yes, yes, and if we miss one, it ain't the end of the world. 
but uh, but I quite like doing it every two weeks. I tell you what I get out of this is it keeps me researching stuff. So yeah. instead of just getting completely absorbed in the woodwork, I actually back up a little, and it's a bit like fixing up your shop or whatever. You get so yep. involved in doing stuff that you let it all pile up, and yep. it's kind of nice to. For me to start reading about and learning about things that I, I wanted to, to uh, increase my depth of knowledge with. Yeah, I agree completely. The other thing I'd like to introduce at some point is, is um, and again, when we go live, live in the building, it might be slightly different, but try to, you know, I'd like to um, introduce a little less of me and a bit more of other people and try and maybe get a few hand people who use hand tools a lot to come in and talk about their furniture or to talk, tell us from their homes. Um, and uh, Dallas and I have talked about that and we've got a couple of ideas. And if you guys have any ideas of someone who inspires you, who, who um, you know, you think has some knowledge that they could, they'd be willing to share, um, we'd love to get that in here as well. And what is that handy little tool uh, work bench? That you have to your right, is that the shops or is that yours or what? Oh, that that is that is a bench. I've, I as you must some of you know, I I, I carve a little bit. Should I move this? Yeah. I carve a little bit, and uh, sometime last year I I thought, well, I I want to do this in the yard rather than in my my garage is north facing, and you know I have people walking by all the time, and I just wanted. There to be times I could just do it in my yard. So I found a design for a carving table, and uh, it's actually, you know, mostly made out of scraps. Uh, the, the top is made out of ash, um, and it's solidly built into the bottom. Um, it's not that heavy a bench, but at home I put in a 55 pound anvil and an old vise, and, and that keeps it down. Um, but what I, I, I set it up so it's got. Uh, it's got one lip here that's on the outside, and up here are some inserts so I can attach a carving by step. So it's, it's basically a little carving um, bench that I personally haven't actually gotten to use much except to somewhere to store stuff on. So um, if it continues to be of use to the shop, we'll leave it here. And uh, when it's not of use, I'll find something else to do with it. But, uh, you know, I set it up fairly carefully, and it's a really nice bench for carving. The two downsides are for me that it, when I carve in the yard, it creates all kinds of mess and I have small, two small dogs and they like to get the chips and, and, and you can't really sweep up in between the bricks and all that stuff. So, Put um, tarp down. Yeah, so it, it didn't really work in the yard, but, but it's a great little presentation table for, for things like this. Um, but there you go, that's, the, that's what that is. Very good. All right. Are we uh, any other questions, comments, suggestions? I said this about four times. Yeah. Nice job. Right. Well, nice thank job. Thank you all for Very good. I, I, I really enjoy um, doing this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys in person. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know it's it's uh, Zoom is a really really neat tool, but it's just not the same as as you know. Having a conversation where three people can talk at once and <laughs> all that fun stuff. So, thank you very much. We'll continue to do this as long as there's a need. And uh, if I ever run out of subjects, we'll we'll go back to the beginning and start again. Okay. But uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. <laughs>